All right, folks, uh, in this video, we're going to discuss the nature of science. In other words, what science is, how science works, right? So we'll talk about uh, what science is, what it isn't. Uh, we'll talk about things such like the scientific method and how science really works. And then we'll finish up talking about uh, science and religion. So what is science? Right? When you think of science, what do you think of, right? Well, I'll tell you what I think of. Science as a tool or a method. Uh, a tool or method for what? A tool or method uh, to investigate the natural world. It's a systematic process, it's a logical process uh, that we use to investigate the natural world around us. Right? Science uses data, data and observations, uh, to discover how our natural world operates. Science is not, however, an all-powerful entity, right? I mean, if you think about how science is sometimes portrayed on TV and in our society, right? It's one of two things. It's either science has shown us this and science has proven that. Well, that's great. I'd like to meet this person, science. Where are they, right? Science, uh, actually, so scientists use the tools, the methods of science to investigate the natural world to figure out how it works, right? Uh, there is one big underlying assumption that uh, all sciences make, not just geology, but physics and chemistry and, and, uh, and all of them, right? And that is that uh, the world and the laws that operate in our universe, the natural laws, the order, right? They have been the same through time. In other words, they are not constantly changing, right? In other words, if you mixed chemical A and chemical B together today, or if you did it, you know, 7 billion years ago, you would get the same results, right? If that is not true, then nothing in science is true. But that is one of the big underlying assumptions. And from what we can tell, uh, that has been the case, right? So how does science work, right? It works through a process called the scientific method. Now this is a general kind of process uh, for investigating the world around us, right? It's a general procedure. Not all scientists go about science the same way, right? So the way I science as a uh, geologist is gonna be quite a bit different than you know somebody doing nuclear uh, uh, chemistry or something like that, right? But in general, there are, are kind of methods and steps, right? Uh, it's uh, a systematic set of observations and experiments that are performed over and over. This is the iterative process, the iterative part of the process. Iterations, if you're familiar with anything from computer science at all, means over and over and over and over and over. And that's how science works. We don't just you know, do something one time and then we're done, right? It is also a peer-reviewed process. Now, what does this mean? This means that uh, your research, your, your methods, your findings are put out there for the rest of your, your peers, your scientific community and colleagues to look at, to analyze for themselves, uh, to respond to, and then to perform those experiments again just to make sure that you uh, did everything correctly, right? So uh, it is kind of a, a self-correcting, self-governing process. Very, very importantly, science operates on this principle that we call falsifiability. And that means it must be able to be proven false. Now, let me give you an example of something that is non-falsifiable, right? Uh, in your bedroom lives a, a little um, um, leprechaun, but every time you turn to look in his direction, he disappears and becomes undetectable by all scientific means, right? This is a non-falsifiable statement. You can't prove me wrong, right? Science requires falsifiable statements, falsifiability. You must be able to be able to prove it wrong in order for you to use science on it, right? Now, I know you've seen this word before, too. This is a hypothesis, right? This is the root of the scientific method. So this is the basis off which science operates, right? So what is a hypothesis? Let's take a look here. A hypothesis is basically a tentative explanation 
based on data and observations, so not just a random guess, right? A tentative uh, explanation based on data and observations uh, and things that you know, right? We then test these hypotheses using the scientific method, right? And again, this can, there's several variations of this, but uh, uh, in general, the scientific method is as follows, right? You make an observation. This sparks a question. The sky is blue. Why is the sky blue? Right? You then do background research. It's very important to do background research because this is another big part of science. What if somebody has already looked into uh, the question that you have? Right? Uh, you should start from what other people have found and, and disproven and in ways that they have investigated and what their findings have been, right? There's no need to reinvent the wheel over and over again, right? So science, you know, it builds upon itself, right? We build upon the knowledge and the, and the, the, uh, the information that's been gained uh, throughout the, the whole uh, history of well, humankind, basically, right? So do some background research. And let's say in this case, nobody has yet investigated why the sky is blue, right? So we did our background research, nobody looked at this question. Uh, so we're gonna come up with a hypothesis, right? This is again a tentative explanation based on data and observations, right? So we form a hypothesis. My hypothesis for why the sky is blue is there is a giant lake up there, right? Now you kind of laugh and smile, right? But, uh, but uh, let's say that the, this is my hypothesis, right? We then need to test our hypothesis, right? And we need to set up the test in such a way that it will prove that it can, it is possible to prove our, our uh, hypothesis wrong. If we don't, it's called a null hypothesis. That's where, you know, either way that the test or your experiment comes out shows you nothing, right? So we wanna set something up. We wanna set up a testable hypothesis, right? So my testable hypothesis for why the sky is blue, right? So my sky, I said the sky is blue. My hypothesis is it's because there's a giant lake up there. So to test my hypothesis, I am going to set up an experiment where I shoot a rocket up into the air, right? Now, my uh, um, results will either be that the rocket comes back wet, which would support my hypothesis, or the rocket comes back dry, which means there's no giant lake in the sky, right? So let's say we test our hypothesis, right? Now let's analyze the results. We shot the rocket up in the sky, right? It comes back, the rocket is soaked. Obviously, I have just proven that there is a giant lake in the sky, correct? No, not correct, right? I have just merely supported the hypothesis, right? I have not uh, proven I have, I have failed to disprove my hypothesis, right? So we test our hypothesis, right? And we can either accept, right? Which doesn't, again, mean that it is correct. Just means that our data from our, our uh, experiment uh, has failed to disprove this hypothesis, right? We could then also reject the hypothesis, right? Um, and that's another important part, a very important part of this, right? So again, this is an iterative process. This can happen over and over and over, right? And then there's also a peer-reviewed process. So I take my data, I take my observations, right? My hypothesis is the sky is blue because there's a giant lake up there. I tested this by sending a rocket up into the sky. It came back wet, and according to my results, that means, you know, supports the idea that there's a giant lake in the sky. Another scientist reads this and says, well, I think maybe it was just raining that day, right? Or there was a big cloud above you, something, right? So he repeats the process. He sets up a test. He shoots a rocket up into the sky. And the rocket comes back dry, right? He has now rejected this hypothesis. And this is very important because, you know, future scientists now can look and spend their energy and time and money researching other reasons for why, why the sky might be blue. We're not stuck with this, you know, there's a giant lake in the sky, right? We have disproven that now, and that is very, very important, right? Being able to prove something wrong right that's how you have to set up your hypothesis must be able one of the results from your test must be able to be 
must prove your hypothesis incorrect, right? And that's very important because the more of these incorrect hypotheses that we eliminate, right? So now we don't have to look in the direction of a giant lake in the sky. Now we can focus on other things. The more of these reasons we eliminate, by definition, you eliminate looking in the wrong direction. You focus in more and more on what must be correct, right? Even whether we ever get there or not, right? So what makes a good hypothesis, right? First of all, a good hypothesis will explain new data, new data that's been collected or found or new observations that have come about after your hypothesis was formed. Right? They will also predict the outcome of new experiments. In other words, the predictions agree with the observations, right? So prediction is a huge thing in the sciences, right? Be having predictive power is huge. It means you are most likely on the right track as far as, as your hypotheses and stuff like that, right? So outcomes of hypothesis testing, right? You can support or accept the hypothesis. And again, as, as we just mentioned uh, with the, the lake in the sky example, this doesn't mean necessarily that you're right, it just means that the outcome of your experiment uh, supports that hypothesis, right? You could also reject the hypothesis. And this, of course, means that the outcome of your experiments shows that that hypothesis is incorrect, right? And again, rejection is not a bad thing. It eliminates an entire direction of investigation, right? Now we can focus our energy on other things. And the more directions we eliminate as incorrect, again, the more we tend to focus in on what must be correct, right? So what is a scientific theory then? A scientific theory is a coherent set of well-tested hypotheses. What do I mean a coherent set? They're looking to explain some various aspect of nature, right? The theory of gravity, the theory of evolution, the theory of con or plate tectonics, which we'll talk about in a couple uh, chapters here, right? Theories also make good predictions. Right? Again, predictive power, huge in science, right? And they stand up to all scientific scrutiny, right? Theories stand up, the moderate, the theories that we currently hold have stood up to all scientific scrutiny to date, right? Not scrutiny from Billy Joe Bob, but scrutiny from the scientific community, right? And that's important because, you know, as we learn new things and eliminate new directions, right, we can adjust and, and, and modify these theories to those new information, right? What then is a model? Well, a model is a combination of hypotheses and theories, and this is actually to represent a system or represent how a system behaves, to model a system, right? And the idea here is to make predictions, right? The one you'll be most familiar with are weather forecasting models, right? So in these models, behind these models are a whole bunch of theories about atmospheric circulation, surface wind circulation, right? Uh, cloud formation, I mean, all this stuff. I'm not a, you know, a meteorologist, so. Uh, but behind there are all these theories and, and hypotheses that come together, right, to create this model. Right, and the way run these these scenarios through, and they predict how the weather is going to be, you know, tomorrow, a day after, the week after, right, right, right. So, uh, and obviously they're always one hundred percent correct all the time, right? Well, no, of course not, because you know a model is only as good as the theories and the information behind it, and we don't know everything. Of course, we'll never know everything, right? But then this is also why you might get a little bit different predictions from different TV stations, right? One might be using a certain model, one might be using a different model, right? That they use to uh, to figure out their their weather forecasting, right? So those are models, right? Now let's talk a little bit about scientific laws, right? Now scientific laws are statements, right? These are statements of relationships that exist between things, 
right? So the universal gravitational law, right? Uh, how gravity operates, right? Uh, or the ideal gas laws, or in a couple chapters, we'll talk about uh, Steno's laws. Uh, and uh, what we're merely saying is, uh, these are statements uh, of relationships that exist between things in our universe, but there is absolutely no mention of the how or the why, right? So those are the realm of hypotheses and theories, right? And here's how they work together, right? The scientific law describes what phenomena happen, right? And then the scientific theory explain why the phenomena occur. And then hopefully if your theory is on the right track, you'll get repeated successful predictions as the outcome of these, these, uh, these theories, right? And this is the law, the area of where we have scientific models, right? So question to you, name a couple things that science has been able to prove right. Let you think about it for a minute here. Think of some of those scientific theories, right? How about uh, uh, gravity, right? Science been able to prove that, right? Evolution, plate tectonics, coming right back to geology, right? Big Bang. Which of these are correct, right? Or which of these? I'm sorry has science been able to prove right? The answer is nothing, nothing. Science proves nothing right. That is not how science works. That is not the nature of science. Let me tell you how science works, folks. It operates on the principle of falsifiability, which means science cannot prove things right. Science can only prove things wrong, right? And this is the power of science, right? So does it make scientific theories weak or does it make them strong? I would say this makes them strong, right? The theories that we currently hold today, right? Well, they're not perfect, right? They have withstood all, all scientific uh, challenges to date and the more challenges a theory uh, withstands, the stronger that theory is, right? Remember with my example about uh, the giant lake in the sky, right? We disproved that there's a, a, a giant lake up there, right? So now we have to look at a different uh, direction, right? The more of these directions we can prove incorrect, again, the more we tend to narrow in on what is actually correct, right? So, if you've got a pet theory that you think is great, right, the best thing you can do for it from a scientific uh, standpoint, throw everything you have at it. Try to disprove your theory. The more you try to disprove your theory and the more that withstands that, uh, the stronger and stronger that theory becomes. And again, this isn't, you know, we don't just, you know, come up with a theory and then never test it again. I mean, this is tested all the time, right? Think about how many scientific theories you are independently testing, not even thinking about it, when you start your car and drive it to the, you know, to the uh, grocery store and, and you know, uh, social distance and all that good stuff while you're there, right? I mean, just think about how many different scientific theories and, and models go into uh, just driving your car to the store, right? So, what about science and religion? Very first video I'm making for the uh, class here. Am I going to go there on the first day? Oh, absolutely, right? So, here in our society, science and religion are often viewed as, as at war with each other or at odds with each other, right? So, therefore, I've got my, uh, my microscope fighting my cross down here, right? But are the two mutually exclusive? Are they necessarily exclusive? And the answer is no. No, this is what we call a false dichotomy, right? A false, you know, dipolarization of the issue, right? As a matter of fact, this current kind of, you know, um, um, uh, 
uh, anti-science uh, fundamentalist uh, young earth creationism has come about really since the 1940s before that there really wasn't you know i mean there were some you know issues here or there but it wasn't you know kind of you know such the big science versus religion thing as it was now right in fact some of the early great scientists and and geologists were very religious people right and also there are hundreds of thousands hundreds of thousands if not millions of religious scientists all over our globe right the vast majority also of scientists, including myself, have absolutely no problem with religion. There's those outstanding ones or, you know, outspoken ones like Richard Dawkins. Right. But but that's uh, that is very much uh, not uh, not the norm. Right. Most scientists have absolutely no problem with religion. Right. And let me tell you a few other things besides. Uh, uh, well, let me put it like this here. Let's see. So, let me go to paint. Paint. There we go. All right. Check this out. So, one of the things that people often say uh, is the reason uh, that science and religion are. Uh, don't interact well with each other, don't play well with each other, is because one is the realm of, you know, by definition, the f natural world, science, right? That's all that investigates the natural world. And religion, of course, by definition, lies in the supernatural, right? So some people will say that they can coexist peacefully because uh, what they call the separate spheres, right? If I could draw a perfect circle here, I wouldn't. We'll call this one science, right? I love my writing, right? And then here is another sphere, right? That we'll call religion, right? Right? And so this would be the realm of the physical world. And this would be the realm of the, uh, you know, the, the, or this would be the natural world. This would be the realm of the supernatural world, right? And never the two shall meet. And that's why they can kind of coexist together. That's not really how I see it. I more view it like this, all right? So let me draw a big circle here, all right? And this will just call, I don't know what you call it, truth, reality, the way things actually are, right? In our world. And this little bubble here, this little bubble here, this is what we can know and what we can investigate with science, right? Now, it's growing right the more and more we discover and the more technology and the more scientific breakthroughs we make right that bubble is growing but it's never going to be everything right i mean there's going to be stuff we definitely can't understand with science right and you know uh we'll never get to know if there's you know not the not through science at least uh if we've ever gotten everything 100 percent correct right but you know, we're doing pretty good, I think, right? The cars make it down the road, our planes fly in the sky, right? All of this good stuff. And all of these physics and these chemical properties, they depend on this natural world, of course, having always existed with the same properties as it does now since the beginning of the universe, right? Now, science, or I'm sorry, religion isn't the only thing that science can't test, right? Because science lies in the natural world. It relies on us having those specific uh, um, uh, properties of science, right? Uh, and, and all the physical and chemical laws, right? Physics and chemistry, physics is chemistry, chemistry is physics, physics and chemistry are basically everything, right? Math is the expression of those, right? Uh, since the beginning of our universe, right, have been the same, right? Uh, so, based on that, here's a few other things science cannot test. Uh, anything that happened before 0 .0001 seconds after the Big Bang, right? Time and space did not exist. Physical laws, right? The, the matter as we restore we not, did not exist. We cannot test that with science, right? 
And according to uh, astrophysics, uh, which sometimes gets weirder than religion if you really get into it, string theory and all that, says that we probably actually live in a multiverse where there are multiple parallel universes uh, together uh, and uh, maybe they're only the millimeters apart and when they touch that's when the Big Bang happens and yada 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 but in these parallel universes right they wouldn't necessarily have the same physics and chemistry they might have different elements different physical and chemical laws right uh, we wouldn't be able to use science there either we could develop something akin to science but we would have to start all over from the beginning all right all right, folks, hopefully you enjoyed this little video. We'll see you next time.